Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of ESDR Kitchen. As you know, we have a series of really exciting live webinars across different themes, and today's theme is the sweet and sour theme. We've got two leaders in the space of AI and dermatology speaking today um, around the topic of game changer or existential threat. And so it's with a uh, huge pleasure on behalf of the ESDR uh, for me to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Veronica Rottenberg. And what I want to highlight is uh, Dr. Rottenberg is a dermatologist at MSKC uh, Cancer Center, and she directs the imaging informatics program in the dermatology service and sees patients at high risk for skin cancer. She received her MD PhD from Duke University with a PhD in biomedical engineering, focusing on elasticity imaging. Her research interests include dermatology, imaging standards, high resolution skin imaging, clinical photography workflows, and AI for diagnosis. Um, and without further ado, um, Dr. Rottenberg, the floor is yours. Please um, take it away for the next 10 minutes. Great. Um, and I am going to share just a few slides um, to make my point um, that uh, it's going to be a game changer, but let me try to figure out how to do this efficiently. Um, I have it under control. Um, it's all good. We've got it. So um, I am going to start by talking about how the AI in dermatology is going to not be an ex existential threat, but rather a game changer. And I'm looking forward to the debate because I think there's obviously nuance to everything that we do. Um, because we had such a short time, I wanted to pick one specific example where I really think we could hash it out, but we can talk about lots of different places. Um, the example that I picked is AI for melanoma. So uh, all of us have been in a situation where we're looking at these dermoscopy images and we think like, man, I got to call a friend. Like, I don't know what to do. Um, you know, I see patients at high risk for skin cancer. Obviously, I want to find these guys before they look like that. Um, and I want to make sure not to biopsy too many of these, especially, you know, on the face, eyelid, all sorts of places where you don't want to do a benign biopsy. Um, I know that in other health systems, it can be very difficult to get in to see a dermatologist. And even in the U.S., in big cities, it can be six to nine month wait. So there's also a lot of potential here. So, you know, I just really wanted to highlight what we know about this. I'm gonna do it so fast. So these are just some examples, you know, ROC curve sensitivity specificity. Ever since about 2016, we've known that AI for melanoma performs really well on dermoscopy images, it improves over time. Starting in 2018, we saw that when you compare these blue dots, which are human experts, with top performing AI models, the AI models outperform pretty much everyone uh, at diagnosing melanoma, with the exception of probably my colleagues at MSK and some colleagues that you can think of right over here in these dots. So what if you could you know, call your friend who performs as well as this every single time that you had a lesion that you were worried about. Um, that's, I think, what the transformative potential of AI is. We also did a prospective study of an open source model called the ADAE. Um, and in that model, we saw that the physician decision to biopsy with the ADAE improved significantly after from when you don't have access to the AI model. So, you know, this is just like phoning a friend, and I think it could really avoid skin biopsies and a lot of lesions and uh, really could make us better at it, something that's pretty difficult for us to do. Uh, there are some remaining clinical implementation issues, but I feel like we're going to get into them. So I probably will try to stop here to leave more time for a debate, um, but Essentially, uh, I think I'm really looking forward to this conversation because I think there's a lot of potential for optimism when we think about how AI can transform and help us in practice. And uh, I want all of us to think creatively about how to do that. 
uh, but I look forward to Dr. Donashu's perspective. Perfect. Thanks so much, Dr. Rottenberg. Um, and I'll put that there on the table. We're, we're all thinking about those next steps. And um, Roxana Danishu is a, a, another fantastic name in this space. And it was a real uh, exciting moment when the both of you accepted to speak at this. And I'll introduce you briefly, um, if I may. Um, you received your undergraduate degree at Rice University in Bioengineering and then did your MD PhD at Stanford, where you worked in the lab of Dr. Russ Altman studying pharmacogenomics in diverse populations. Um, at this time, you were a Howard Hughes Medical Institute medical scholar and you received the Paul and Daisy Soros Fellowship for New Americans. You completed your dermatology residency at Stanford in the research track and completed a postdoc with Dr. James Tao in biomedical data science working on AI for healthcare. She, you are an assistant professor uh, of biomedical data science and dermatology and the assistant director for, of the Center for Precision Health with Pharmacogenomics. Um, and it's a great privilege to hear you speak. Raghavana, please, um, the floor is yours. Thank you. So Dr. Rotenberg and I are actually great colleagues who publish together, who write grants together, who are actually very aligned in our thinking. And, and it, actually, when we were trying to decide how we were going to divvy this up, we kept debating, no, you take the pro, no, you take the con, just, you know, just to say that, you know, we're actually perfectly aligned. Um, and I share a lot of her optimism, but I also have some concerns. And I will first state, but that even though I, I suggested the title, you know, game changer or existential threat to be really edgy, um, I actually am not really worried about the existential threat aspect of it. There are other things that I am concerned about that I do think that we have to solve in order to do clinical implement implementation of these models. So um, one thing I have cared about a lot ever since my days doing my PhD work is bias. And there has been significant concern um, starting with an excellent commentary by Dr. Ade Adamson in JAMA Dermatology, um, who was a little bit of ahead of his time thinking about this, saying, hey, I'm worried that there are going to be people who are not represented in these AI models. Um, there have been issues with tech companies who have tried to build apps in this space that have excluded people with dark skin tones. Um, and just generally, you know, our medical system at least both Dr. Rotenberg and I practice in the United States, where there are significant health disparities and um, there are certain populations who are just not well represented. There are a lot of uh, issues with systemic racism and these things can get baked right into the algorithms if we're not careful. And so one thing that we did, and actually Dr. Rotenberg is a, is a senior author on this paper as well, uh, is look at back, you know, in in 20 up until 2020 looking at like what data sets were being used to develop AI algorithms and what we found are uh, multiple issues one was that people were developing algorithms which were used to try to detect malignancies or skin cancers without having a gold standard histopathological diagnosis so they were labeling images of skin disease with a diagnosis using a dermatologist, and they had no clinical history, no histopath. And that leads to pretty noisy labels. As Dr. Rotenberg mentioned, you know, dermatologists have varying um, success diagnosing melanoma from image with no history, uh, you know, image alone with no history, there are different papers that say anywhere from, you know, one, one out of se seven lesions needed to biopsy to find a true melanoma, nine lesions needed to biopsy. So these noisy labels were likely um, having misdiagnosis in them. And then these label, these labeled data were being used to train AI algorithms. So that's one issue is label noise. And I will say that the work that Dr. Rotenberg has done in the trial that she presented has no label noise because they biopsied every lesion. So I think that's like an important point to make about that is how you should be, you know, you should either be doing biopsying or monitoring 
of something that's obviously benign. You don't have to, you, we don't often biopsy obviously benign lesions, but um, some way to really know for sure that something is benign. The other huge concern is that these data sets are likely not representative. Most of the papers, 90% of the papers had no description of the skin tones used to, um, to train or test these models. So the images that were being used to basically teach algorithms what different skin diseases look like were, were mostly likely on white skin. And the small 10% uh, that did report it, they either excluded dark skin tones or significantly underrepresented them, um, which is a huge problem. And this is something actually uh, that we've tested before. We created our own data set of diverse skin disease matching Fitzpatrick one and two and five and six on different demographic factors and disease and tested three prior uh, publicly available algorithms that had state-of-the-art performance and found that basically, you know, the closer you are to this red line here, the worse you're doing and that these algorithms performed a lot worse on images of Fitzpatrick five and six. And so there's clearly a discrepancy in performance. You can fix that, by the way, and we've shown that if you actually include diverse data when you train the, train the algorithm. So it's, it's not a problem that's impossible to fix, but it's something that people really need to be thoughtful about. I actually threw in something about large language models here because I'm sure that everybody here is talking about large language models. I have never been in a point in my career where literally everybody on the street is talking about AI. Um, even though I live in Silicon Valley, even when I travel to other places, and I know a lot of people in dermatology have been playing about these things. So I just wanted to just give a little bit of airtime to this, even though it's tangential to the computer vision discussion we were having. So the thing about large language models is that they're trained on very large corpuses of data. And in the initial training, they are not trained necessarily to understand anything about the accuracy of the language that's used. They're simply trained to kind of predict what the next word is. So they take the sentences, imagine mask different words and teach the model to be able to predict what the next word is given a sentence structure. And you do this over a very large body of data. And then from there, you have this um, uh, this more supervised uh, training where it gets, we do re something called reinforcement learning with human feedback. Humans interact with the model. They give feedback as to whether the answers are good or not. And that can be used to kind of try to get it to say things that are more accurate or sound more correct. So the thing about these models is that they can sound very convincing because they're really good at knowing what human language is supposed to sound like. Um, and so I always say it can be convincing and correct, or it can be convincing and dead wrong. And so for example, here, it is making up citations that don't exist when you ask about sunscreen if you ask it to write a bio about me, it says that I got my MD from Harvard, which I've never attended, um, and that I have a PhD in biophysics, which I do not have. Um, and at the time that I wrote this, I wasn't yet an assistant professor, but it seemed to think at that time that I was. Um, and so the thing is, if you didn't know anything about me and you read this bio, it sounds so convincing. And that's really dangerous when it comes to things like automation bias, because you can be lulled into believing if you don't know what the real facts are and you're relying on this model to help give you information and facts. The other thing I wanted to point out is similar to what I mentioned before about computer vision models, um, there are bias in these models as well. Um, for example, if you do a task where you ask it to finish the sentence, but you do not give the gender of the individual in the sentence, it will say that the engineer, the doctor, the CEO are all male. But if he has a finished a sentence about the student later referred to their parent picking them up from school, the model completes it with my mom thinks I did well on the exam. So the parent who's doing the picking up is the mother. 
So there, we know that there's these social biases baked into the system and racial biases. And actually in a study that again was with Dr. Rotenberg, as I mentioned, we work a lot together. We looked at questions um, pulled from previous studies where they asked trainees questions to look at racial biases that trainees have. And we asked it questions that we thought might perpetuate race-based medicine. And we found some really concerning things like it perpetuating things that we know that are not true, such as um, differences in muscle mass between races, which we know is a debunked thing given that race is a social, not a biological thing. And so um, we just have to be very careful with these large language models. And of course, now there are vision language models. So I think it is important to think about in vision language, you're taking the um, sort of the computer vision uh, tasks that we talked about before and pairing it with large language models. So you can actually interact, but also have images in play. And so I think understanding these biases are just really key um, for us to be able to do something that's actually going to try we, to actually build something that is not going to cause more harm because it has these baked in biases in in there um, we want to build stuff that actually makes our patient outcomes better improves our clinical workflows but does not cause um, harms to our most vulnerable patients and i will yield the floor with that that's really wonderful and thank you so much for for um sharing that point i think um whilst we're waiting for, for questions to come in from the audience, and um, if there are uh, any elements, um, Dr. Rottenberg, that you want to reply to, um, please, please feel free to. Um, but um, I was so glad that you brought up um, large language models, because I feel that after that seminal nature paper that kind of made us all aware as, as dermatologists about the possibilities of um, diagnosis, you know, from images, I felt that the other notch that, you know, suddenly um, got ratcheted up was when large language models were accessible on people's smartphones and, and were being used in a whole range of different ways, you know, from getting through different exams, um, you know, a, a range of different societal fronts suddenly, you know, realized that this had landed basically. And, and, I just wondered, you know, looking ahead, um, what do you see as, you know, possibly the next disruptive moment in terms of how we increasingly realize that this is around us or is going to be, you know, part of our day to day existence? Do you see, um, you know, anything on the horizon uh, when you're scanning ahead that looks like, you know, this is going to be, you know, the next moment when we all sit and think, right, you know, um, either the assistance just got a lot better or, you know, we've got to up our game or we have to just, you know, integrate more because, you know, the standards just um, uh, increase. And, and you hinted a little bit around LLMs that, you know, incorporate uh, images in, in sort of queries, for example. Um, and, and I was curious, you know, based on your, your uh, perception, uh, both of you, um, whether you felt that, you know, there was something else on the horizon that, you know, dermatology would do well to be aware of and, and to start thinking about incorporating in, in, into planning. Well, I do think, you know, as uh, Dr. Donahue said, the multimodal aspect, you know, previously it was so painful to try and integrate different types of information into one model that a specific pain point has essentially gone away. Um, so I think, you know, taking into account, I had a patient recently where like, uh, I didn't know how big something was and they had a CT scan from months ago that showed it clearly extending into the fat. And so like trying to take in multiple different types of information from all across the different types of systems that we have, I think is actually a pretty short term future state. Right. Um, how it performs, I think, is exactly as Dr. Donishu says, the more complex these systems are, the more difficult they are to validate and benchmark. And so uh, we're going to have a lot of work to do that. No, um, thank you. Um, can I also ask a little bit about, you know, how we're making progress towards understanding the black box behind, you know, some of the decision making? Um, and and um, Roxana, I really liked your your recent uh, piece of work, which was, you know, one thing that flagged up on my on my radar. And I don't know whether I could invite you to comment a little bit about how you're approaching trying to understand how 
um, the decision making process is made in some of these scenarios. Yes, thank you so much for the opportunity. I mean, I think there's a lot of debate on um, AI interpret what we call interpretability or explainability, post hoc explainability. The, the reason there's such a debate is, do you even need it, right? If you have a model that you've done well-run randomized controlled trials on, on diverse populations, and you have systems in place to monitor performance, should you even care how it's making the decisions? Um, and I'm torn on that. In some sense, I obviously do explainability research because for me, it's kind of interesting to understand what biases might exist in the model, but I am not of the camp that it is required um, because the thing is, is that anytime you build in an explainability technique, you are making some assumptions and, you know, distilling some information from the model, but you're not capturing everything. There's definitely things that you can miss and you might be lulled into sort of a false sense of security that this thing is working when there could actually be other things that your explainability model is not capturing that are driving the decision. Um, but in my prior work, as you referenced, um, we have used generative models to take derm images and essentially slowly tweak small features about them, such as the pigmentation or the presence of erythema or the presence of different artifacts, such as hair, um, things like that. We've made, we actually, to be honest, we didn't tell it what tweaks we, it, it should made, make um, because that's actually a, a very difficult problem to specifically use uh, generative models to make specific uh, changes. We actually just said make small changes so that the image flips in its decision when it's put in the model so that it goes from a benign to a malignant or a malignant to a benign. Um, and so after we did that, we then asked the dermatologist to look at the pairs of images and they had no idea which one was malignant and benign and tell us all the differences between the images. And doing that, we were able to find um, relevant factors such as changes in pigmentation, but also things that might be a bit spurious, such as like the presence of hair. And there has been previous work, including by Dr. Rotenberg, showing that you know these models can rely on some of these artifacts. But what was useful here is that we were able to, at some point, at some in some sense, look at some causality of what these features were that were causing the flipping on a very large scale. Um, again, as I said, I don't think that means that you need explainability built into every model, but we are building tools that will allow some level of auditing afterwards to help, right. you know, help us understand what's going on in that black box. And I also think it's it's something where we are trying to encourage a, a workforce to, you know, um, adopt and accept and integrate. You know, this goes some way in terms of, you know, building that, um, I think, ability to trust a system. So I think I think it is part of the deal, perhaps. I'm going to read out some of the questions and also welcome to um, Professor Tooting, who's, um, I think, been delayed, but um, our, our co-host uh, today. Hi, Thomas. Um, Hi. Um, I, I'm just going to read out the, the first question and in summary from from the floor uh, from Christian Aldridge. And um, it's a long question. So I, I hope I'm summarizing it OK, Christian. And this is uh, to, to both of you. Um, it's a question about, I guess, this uh, approach of diagnosing malignancy um, as, as one route that that's put across and detecting melanoma uh, being a priority. But in, in say the UK healthcare system, which is mentioned here, um, a lot of things that we are um, faced with in terms of just numbers of patients we have to see relate to benign lesions. And so in terms of um, a bit around what we were talking about, gold standard, you know, data sets, you know, a lot of that clearly is in things that are excised, but we don't tend to excise so many things that are benign. Um, I, I take the questions along the lines of how, you know, AIs could be trained in that space of being really good at telling people that benign things are benign and, and taking that home. And, and perhaps that poses a particular challenge if currently they wouldn't normally be biopsied and hence don't inform the gold standard data sets. But um, we invite comment from, from both of you on that. Um, I think it's a really interesting question, and it's a great use case because the images are so standardized, the uh, population is very well defined, um, there's a lot of potential opportunity there. 
Um, I think you've brought up, Neil, a bunch of the issues, you know, um, in the U.S., there's been a lot of regulatory attention about biopsying the non-malignant lesions. Uh, I think I've certainly gone on record as saying I'm not sure that that's required. Certainly, you have to define clearly how you're going to label the gold standard for benign lesions. Historically, we've had, you know, monitoring for six months without change, which does not reduce the expense of your trial, you know, making sure all those patients come back in six months is expensive, but at least you're not mandating unnecessary biopsies in a patient who, as part of standard of care, would not get biopsied. Um, and also, you know, the UK is a perfect place to try to run a randomized trial. There may be effects that you don't predict or know uh, about using a triage tool. There may be standards for sensitivity that you really need to set so that you don't miss a melanoma. And then the benefits of specificity may not be as great as a, a clinician, but we don't know the answer to any of those questions. Uh, so I think that that's really, uh, really important. No, awesome. Thank you, Veronica. That's great. Um, the next question is from uh, Charles Cassius, and um, it is very brief. It's, um, you've talked about AI and melanoma. Uh, the question is, is it used in, or is it useful in inflammatory skin disease? And I don't know whether you can comment on that. Yeah, so I would say that there are many papers who have used it in inflammatory skin disease. Um, you know, I think a lot of Dr. Rotenberg's work has focused on melanoma and she's been a pioneer and leader in this space, but there are certainly publications looking at diagnostics around inflammatory skin disease, looking at um, automatic assessment of total body surface area, which is important for trials and for therapeutic decision making. Um, it's, you know, there have been many, many, many use cases beyond melanoma things around burns, things around hair, um, you know, all sorts of different kinds of models that have been uh, built and not all of them computer vision. We as mostly focused on computer vision, but you can build models to make predi predictions off of insurance claims data, for example, or EMR data. Um, and as was also mentioned before, the most exciting thing that's coming down the pipeline is multimodality, being able to take large volumes of data, multiple types of imaging, text, putting that in and being able to make a decision. So it is not constrained at all by disease. Okay, now that, that's really good to know about its generalizability. Uh, I want to go to the next question and then possibly our last one given the time. And this is from Brent Mancher. And uh, the question is, if we talked about an... Uh, assist um, in the clinical setting, um, there are possibly a few windows when that could be employed, right? Um, and, and I guess this is meant to be slightly provocative and, and to make us think, um, is this perhaps best used live whilst the patient is in the room and informs the consultation in real time? Um, could this be used, say, after the patient leaves the room um, and, you know, it's um, something which is like a quality uh, check for the, for the physician and then it informs you know finally something that goes back to the patient or perhaps after the visit completely and say from a third party say you know the images are submitted to um, the insurance company and they look to see as to how things match up for example um, so so I don't know whether you know the timing of, of when it's used has been discussed much but if you have a view on that we'd be really interested. Uh, I guess briefly, I would just say that we have two major areas of research that we need to think about. One of them is obviously like optimizing algorithm accuracy for your use case. And the other one is optimizing like benefit for our patients. That's the right. ultimate right. thing we need. And that's a totally different area of research. You know, you need to think, figure out like what is the interface design that's going to optimize the clinician AI interaction. You need to think about all sorts of different things in that space that aren't just like what's the AUC for melanoma. Right. Um, I think, you know, if we really have algorithms that benefit patients that are better at diagnosis than us, that are better at monitoring than us, that can quantify things that we can't quantify, uh, real time in the clinician office, 
it that does not impact our existing clinical workflow <laughs> is probably the ideal situation right. because we the last thing we want is a patient to have to come back for another visit when they waited nine months for the first one because our AI tool took two hours to run. So sure. you know, I I don't think that modern algorithms and modern com computing are really going to be a barrier to real time feedback, but um, that's that's just what I think. But I think it needs to be studied and is a good question, Brent. Perfect, awesome. Um, I, I just um like to to thank you both. Really, I think we'll have to close there um on on the hour as as, as planned. Uh, but that's been a really fascinating um uh dialogue and and expose on this, and I think it will leave many of us um with many questions and things to go away to think about. Um. Thank you so much. I'd also like to advertise the next ESDR Kitchen that's coming up. Uh, and it's the perfect recipe to initiate a startup, if people are interested, by Nicola Brambilla. Um, and this will be on the 15th of November in 2023 at, at half one Central European time. Um, and Leah, the next slide, please. Um, you need to know that these are recorded and we have them on uh, our channel. And if you would like to access any of this after the show, um, they're available there. And finally, we would like to thank our sponsors uh, today. Uh, that was UCB, um, and th they've supported um, all the resources we needed to deliver this uh, webinar. So uh, thanks again to our speakers, um, to uh, our co-hosts, our sponsors, and ESDR. Have a good evening, and um, thanks, everyone. Bye for now.